That lighting looks a little different, doesn't it, today? Yeah. Yeah, we, all the lights throughout the entire campus have been replaced with uh, LED lights, right? Yeah, so these are kind of cool. Going to save money, uh, not send as much money to SDG&E and keep it here to do ministry. So, Well, today we're continuing our sermon series, the Believe Sermon Series. And is, if you haven't guessed already, our theme for today is joy. I'd like to start by uh, taking kind of an impromptu poll, if you don't mind. Uh, would you please raise your hand if you would like to have joy in your life? Well, I kind of predicted that. That's a no-brainer, isn't it? I mean, who doesn't want joy? We all want joy in our life. Now, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand again. But I have a hunch I would see a few less hands if I asked you to raise your hands if you would characterize this past week as being a joy-filled week. We all want joy. In fact, we crave for joy in our lives. But sometimes it just seems so elusive. Our key verse for today that's helping us to to keep our focus on the theme of joy comes from John chapter 15, verse 11. Jesus spoke these words to his apostles, but he's speaking these words to each and every one of us here this morning. And he's saying to us, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. How about that? Jesus wants us to have joy. And not just any joy, but he wants us to have his joy. He wants us to have his joy that's not halfway, it's not incomplete, it doesn't need to be added to in order to make it complete. No, he wants us to have his joy that is complete and full. Unfortunately, though, this is not what most of us experience in, well, our day-to-day Christian lives. So, so what is joy? Where do you find joy? Well, the Bible's answer is actually really incredibly clear and simple. Joy is known, joy is found in knowing Jesus and in being Jesus to others. Would you join me in prayer? Lord God, we thank you for gathering us here together. And Father, we thank you that, uh, we thank you for your word. Father, as we focus our thoughts on your word that direct us to the joy of Christ that he desires to be in our life, we ask you that your Holy Spirit would just lower the barriers into our lives, lower the barriers and walls into our hearts and minds so that we may hear that exact word that you are seeking to speak into our lives. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Well, as a young man, not surprisingly, I I made the young man mistake of anchoring my life to events that would bring me happiness. I mean, after all, that's what life is about, right? Making me happy. And so I would set up event after event after event, all of them designed to bring me happiness. But I recall one instant one day when a really bad event happened. And it utterly shattered, it destroyed my happiness in an instant. It was gone. It was, in that, it was on that occasion that it dawned on me how empty and how roller coaster a life would be that was anchored to events that make me happy or not. You know, one of our biggest challenges is is that we confuse happiness with joy. They're not the same at all. Happiness is dependent upon the outward circumstances of our life. Now, as a result of that, happiness is here and then it's gone. Happiness is with us when one moment and then something happens and bam, in an instant, that happiness is gone. Joy, it is completely different. Uh, The Bible, again, it clearly tells us that that joy is anchored in our faith that knows Jesus. Joy is anchored in knowing that Jesus loves us. Joy is uh, is found in knowing that Jesus died for our sins. It is that simple. It'd be nice to that it would perhaps if it was more complicated, but it's not. 
Our joy is anchored to the promises in God's word, promises like John 15, 9. John 15, 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Our joy is anchored to knowing that the way that God loves Jesus, that's the exact way that Jesus loves you and me. Joy is anchored in knowing God's grace, his mercy, and his forgiveness. And those are three things that are never going to change. They're never going to go away. They are the sure anchor of our life. If you take a look at Paul, the Apostle Paul in the New Testament, a uh, good thing for him, he did a pretty good job in his life distinguishing the difference between happiness and joy. It's a good thing he could do that because... Once he made that decision to, to follow Christ, no matter where, his life got pretty difficult. Now listen to how Paul describes his life. This is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He describes his life this way. Five times the Jewish leaders gave me 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. Once I spent a whole night and a day adrift at sea. I have traveled on many long journeys. I have faced dangers from rivers and from robbers. I have faced danger from my own people, the Jews, as well as the Gentiles. I have faced danger in the cities, in the deserts, and on the seas. And I have faced danger from men who claim to be believers but are not. You know, in light of Paul's life, you know, last week my getting into what was absolutely the most painfully slow checkout line at the grocery store, it was a pretty inconsequential event. In, in light of Paul's description, everything that he went through, I mean, the fact that, you know, some guy decided to back up into my car last night, well, that's a pretty inconsequential event. Despite the hardships in Paul's life, listen to what he wrote, and he wrote these words from prison. Writing from prison to the Philippians, in Philippians chapter 4, Paul says, Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. How in the world could Paul possibly write those words from a prison? Not a modern day prison, but a, a, a dungeon of a prison of, in the Roman Empire. How is it possible that Paul could write words like these where he says, In all troubles... My joy knows no bounds. Well, my guess is Paul did not see his life as a sequential series of hilltop highs and valley lows. Us as Westerners, we typically view the journey of our life through the metaphor of, of, of a timeline. We're walking on that timeline through a series of linear events. Sometimes it leads us to mountaintop highs, other times to valley lows. A better metaphor to understand how Paul's faith led him to view life is that of a railroad track. Every day, Paul's faith allowed him to get glimpses and to see God's grace, God's love, and God's mercy. He would see that in God's word, the scripture. He would see that in the actions and the words of people. He would see that in the beautiful creation that God had around him. But at the exact same time in Paul's life, painful and difficult things were happening. So you've got these two rails. The one rail of the train is no Paul knowing God's grace and his mercy. The other rail of this railroad track are the events of Paul's life. Sometime, sometimes that rail, you, you're going to be having great times, sometimes bad times. But those rails are absolutely parallel to one another. 
So no matter where you are, whether you're experiencing a good time or a bad time, God's joy is still there and it's still visible. You know, in our life, there are a lot of what I call joy busters. There are, they're all over the place, wanting to pop the joy right out of our life. But the single greatest joy buster that I can think of, and then when I take a look at Scripture, the single biggest joy buster is one that's it's hard to talk about. It's called unrepentant sin. It's even difficult to say. Listen to the words of King David. Uh, these words, are come, they come from Psalm 32. Now, King David had just had an affair with Bathsheba. King David had just seen to it Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was murdered. And David, King David was doing everything he can to hide these truths. Listen to how that unconfessed sin impacted him. I'm actually going to start with verse 3, so the wording may be a little messed up, and then I'm going to come back to verse 1. David said, When I refused to confess my sin, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord, and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. And then going back to verse 1, Oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. When unconfessed sin is in my life, bad things are going to be happening in my life, without a doubt. But probably the worst thing that's going to be happening is that unconfessed sin has this way of just blinding us to God's grace and His mercy. Blinded of God's grace, my life continues. I, I continue that sequence of events, good times and bad times. It continues to roll on. But being blinded, I no longer see God's grace, His forgiveness. I no longer see His love. And with those things gone, joy, it just evaporates. It's gone. And the only thing you know what we're left with? is that cheap substitute that we call happiness. Well, there's also joy builders. The greatest, one of the greatest joy builders is this, is knowing that God, he's a joyful God. I know it's so easy and so tempting to, to see God as this kind of, this, this grumpy old man. You know, this crotchety old guy who wants to be left alone, who doesn't want to be with us or anything like that. That is so far away from the truth of who God truly is. God rejoices in being with us. God literally rejoices and spins in joy because he could be in our presence, because we're in his presence. The, the Hebrew word for joy paints this picture of a little child jumping up around and spinning in joy. That's exactly what God does when he knows that he can be with us. Uh, listen to how God's joy, how we see God's joy in this parable. Uh, Jesus told this parable, it's recorded in Luke 15. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Uh, doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. In this parable, not only do we see that God is a joyful God, he wants to be with us, but we also get a glimpse into how we can experience that joy. There is an inexpressible joy when we can be a part of God's work. A part of God's work carrying 
the love and the mercy and the grace of God through Jesus Christ to others who don't know him. When we are working with God to do exactly that, God is rejoicing and something else happens. Our heart rejoices too. A perfect example of that was, was last Sunday. Uh, last Sunday, uh, we, uh, uh, at, right after the 1030 service here, we packed, we prepared 52,000 individual meals. Hey, give yourself a hand for that. That was awesome. In this small little gym, we crammed over 300 people who were working at assembly line tables for over an hour and a half. And yet, despite all those circumstances, this room was just exploding in joy. I, I cannot tell you how many people over this past week have come to me and said, you know, Pastor, that was a really special event. They're right, it was a special event. And I'm convinced that the reason why it was special is because God was rejoicing. God knew that through those humble little food packets that we were preparing, children in Argentina, yes, they were going to get a good meal, but children and moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas, they were going to be drawn a little closer to knowing who Jesus is. Jeez, God was rejoicing as we were packing those. You know, another really good example of, of, of being the mercy and the goodness of, of, of Jesus to other people is found in one of our members. It's a member that many of you know, Niles Shreve. Niles, would you come on up? Uh, Niles is uh, uh, an attorney, but several uh, years ago, he left full-time practice in order to carry out ministries of mercy in Mexico as well as Burundi. He recently got back from Burundi, and I asked him to come up this morning to tell us a little bit about this transition into a, a missionary, but also how he sees hardship and joy running together in his work in Burundi. Well, for those of you who know me, you know that I made the decision to go into full-time ministry several years ago when I had an unmistakable and direct call from God that I was to follow him no matter what. And um, you also know that there have been hardships associated with that. Um, there has been the financial hardship, obviously. There's also been the hardship of explaining to my friends, what are you doing, Niles? Why would you leave a full-time law practice? Why would you follow this prompting, how do you know that you've been called? But even though there have been hardships in the process in throughout the, the time, there's been tremendous joy. In fact, it's been overwhelming joy in serving in, serving in Mexico first and now in Burundi as well. Um, there's been overwhelming joy. And the primary reason for that is that it's a joy of service. Jesus was a servant king. And he found joy in service to other people. And I have found that joy as well in serving other people. In particular, in serving in Burundi, I've found tremendous joy in the fact that we've made such an incredible impact, not only as a small organization, Francis Kitchen, but as a congregation. It's amazing to see the transformation that's happening because of our part in the work in Burundi. For example, on my most recent trip, one of the things we did was visit the village that we have been supporting now for a couple of years. We built 46 houses there. We have a feeding program, a porridge program that's responsible for saving hundreds of lives. In fact, I learned on this particular trip that in a village just next door to our village, they lost 21 children to starvation in the month of March. And in our village, we lost none. It's because our porridge, prob our porridge program has solved the hunger problem for the children in our small village. In addition, in Burundi, we have sponsored uh, school uniforms and school supplies for children in the village that we support. Some of those kids have gone from being outcasts 
and uh, despise to being top of their class. It's an amazing transformation. We've also um, supported medical programs to help people get medical care from our community. We've also been working on training pastors and Bible teachers, lay leaders, to teach orality, which is biblical storytelling. It's making a huge impact. Thousands of people are coming to Christ, coming, <clears throat> excuse me, coming to Christ because of the biblical storytelling training that we're doing. Most recently, we've begun to work with an orphanage called the Cries of a Child in Burundi, and the Cries of a Child does amazing work that uh, I just don't have time to tell you about. But those of you who know me and know about my travels, both in Mexico and especially in Burundi, know that it takes a very uh, big toll on me, physically as well as emotionally. I come back from these trips pretty well spent uh, physically and emotionally, and so the quantum of happiness goes down for a significant period of time, weeks. But at the same time, the joy of service continues to override those feelings of exhaustion, a little bit of melancholy, depression, the blues, whatever you want to call it. But the joy of serving overrides that uh, considerably. So I guess to summarize and to tie it into pastor's message, even though I go through mountains and valleys in life and especially in my work in these poor places, I see death and starvation and privation and just a great deal of difficulty, there's always the overlying uh, covering, if you will, of joyousness that comes with service and I encourage you all to get involved in Christian service and uh, like you did with the feeding or the uh, food packing event last week and as you work in missions and continue to extend yourself to people all throughout the world. Thank you. Good, yeah, thank you, Niles. <clears throat> the world wants us to settle for happiness but that's a cheap substitute for the anchor that will not give. And that true anchor is joy. Joy in knowing Jesus' love and joy in being Jesus to others. Would you join me in prayer? Oh, Lord God and Father, we thank you. Thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. You love us so much. You, 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 so much joy comes to you as we are able to go to you because our sins are washed away because of Christ's sacrifice on the cross. Oh Lord, we pray that you would strengthen our faith and that we would know more joy. Oh, Father, we pray that as we know this joy, you would enable us and empower us and give us the desire to be Jesus every single day to those around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen.